Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. Beautiful Florida day. Thanks for joining us this morning here, as well as those who are online. Good morning. Hi, Mom. How you doing? Stay warm. Yes, yeah, she, she watches from Michigan. Uh, a couple of things to, to give you highlights on. The annual meeting for the congregation is this evening. So if you are a member of the congregation, uh, please join us this evening for the annual meeting. And if you are a deacon or a deaconess, it's important that you come tonight. Uh, there'll be meetings after the meeting, so for those two groups. Also, if you're wondering, we will be having a youth yard sale this year, uh, last Saturday in February the 27th. So you can prepare all your goodies and uh, treasures and prepare to bring them to church. Uh, put them in the sanctuary, in the life center rather, on the stage. And of course, if you need any help with that, any transportation help, just give me a buzz here at the office and we'll set you right up for that. All right, so let's take a time of prayer and get ready for service. Would you pray with me this morning? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, to worship with your family, God. We thank you that despite all the craziness in the world, Father, that you are our refuge, you are our strong tower. Mm -hmm. We can lean on you, Father. But Lord, we know that there are people who are, who are sick, who are hurting, who are lonely, who are depressed, Father all kinds of different things that are going on. But Father, we just ask your blessing on, on all who need you. And Father, I ask that you would just meet us today, meet us here in this building. Let your Holy Spirit fill this place, God. Help us to have ears to hear what your word has for us today. Father, bless uh, Ted and the worship team as they lead us. And God, we just ask that you would be here in this service today. And also for the people who are at home, Father, bless them and meet them where they are as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. We are glad that you are here this morning to worship the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is worthy of our worship, and we praise his holy name. We're going to invite you to stand together as we sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. Let's stand together and sing. It is real joy to uh, introduce to you, uh, we have, uh, that's going to come alongside Pastor Ted, me, <laughs> and uh, this uh, semester, if you're in school, uh, a young, uh, young student who's a senior at Trinity College of Florida, and we're delighted to have him as our student intern for this semester, and uh, so Mr. James Snyder is going to come, we're going to have him come to the platform. You'll notice that... Uh, uh, you know, he, I, I get to look up to him, and uh, <laughs> great respect. And as, uh, as we do, we're going to ask the elders to come. And uh, so uh, we want the elders to come. We're going to pray for uh, James. What James is going to do uh, this semester, he'll be uh, shadowing me a little bit, and uh, he'll be with the youth, he'll be with the children uh, a little bit. And just kind of getting a taste on what pastoral ministry is about. So you can pray for him. And then you can pray for me. And uh, no, we, we are just excited for him. He is just a wonderful student and, uh, and a man of God, loves the Lord. He is engaged uh, to a wonderful Christian gal who is away this morning at her home church, Deltona Alliance Church getting fitted for her wedding dress. And they're going to get married in May. Yeah, so you can pray extra hard for them, Bethany. So James and Bethany. But we're so grateful for James and his willingness to, to uh, trust us to uh, just help him fulfill some of his requirements for school. So let's uh, pray together. Let's pray over him. Father God, I thank you so much for James and, and Lord, his testimony, how you've led him how you brought him to faith in you, how you raised him up in our sister church down in uh, North in South Florida there in North Fort Myers. And uh, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for how you've led him uh, to Trinity College of Florida and the call that you placed upon his life uh, to seek you, to follow you in pastoral ministry. And so, Lord, I pray today that this uh, will continue to be uh, the beginning of that great work that you've done in his heart. And Lord, that uh, as you continue to lead him and guide him and direct him, Father, that you'll give him a, a hunger and thirst for you, for righteousness' sake. We pray that you'll give him a hunger and thirst for your word. We pray that you will just bless him in all his relationships, work and family and home, and especially in his relationship with Bethany. And Father, that as you continue to work in them, that you'll guide, direct, protect, and provide. And so bless our time now, we pray. And we thank you for what you're going to accomplish in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 
Amen. He's going to lead us in scripture at this point. Yeah. Thank you, James. Thank you, elders. I'm going to read from John chapter 11, uh, verse 18 to 27. And it says this. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said something very powerful to her. He, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is come into the world. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand together now and let's sing a wonderful worship song to the Lord. Mighty to save. Can move the mountains. My 
God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. the glory of the risen Father, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. We thank you that Jesus even declared that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes unto the Father except through him. We pray today, Lord, that as your word is proclaimed all throughout the land, all throughout the world, as the gospel goes forth, Father, that you will let your word go forth with power. We know that your word will go forth and it will not return empty or void. 
And so we thank you for the strength of your word. We thank you that Jesus Christ is the living word. And we give you glory today. May your word dwell richly in our hearts and in our minds and in our thoughts for your glory, that you will continue to do that transforming work that will bring praise to your name. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Almighty God. We praise you, Holy Spirit. Come and have your way in us in these moments. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As you're being seated, the children can be dismissed for Children's Church at this time. It is wonderful uh, to celebrate every Sunday the worth of Jesus. Jesus, only Jesus. So grateful that we can bring the word of God together and exalt his name together and honor his name together. And it's good to have uh, little ones running through the church. I love it. It's awesome. It's terrific. And uh, we rejoice in that. And if uh, you want to help out with children's ministry, please see us. And uh, it's a little plug for them. It's it's wonderful. Um, You know, our wonderful Savior even valued children. He did. He allowed them to come unto him. His disciples didn't really want to receive children, you know, and we understand that at times when children have uh, the grumpies and uh, they're hungry or they're messy or they're super energetic and we don't know how they got that energy in the first place and we wish we had some of it. And Jesus knew all about that, but he told his disciples, no, let the little children come to me. He honored them. He said, for such is the kingdom May we come to the Father this morning, come into the throne room as a little child, right? Amen. We've been looking together, traveling together these past days, and we are part of a greater movement called the Christian Missionary Alliance, and some of our sister churches uh, in the nation are uh, joining in with us in uh, what is called 40 Days of Prayer, praying for not only your needs, that you bring to the Father, but also the needs of others, also the needs of our church family, our flavor in Christianity, our praying for our missionaries, our international workers, those around the world. But as we embrace God, we discovered that God is holy. And we looked at Isaiah. And how Isaiah was just caught up with the holiness of God and realized as he searched his own heart, he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And uh, he didn't know what to do and God provided atonement with the angel. Beautiful, piece of coal, boom. And then because Isaiah was changed, his sins were forgiven. His sins were atoned for. He said, here am I, Lord. Send me. I'll go and proclaim the good news. The good news. We discovered together what it meant to repent of our sins, to turn away from that old lifestyle and desire a new lifestyle. And the only way really we can do it is to be wholly sanctified, to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God continually. It's not a one-time act. It's an act saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit today that my countenance will shine for Jesus, my thoughts will be set apart unto Jesus, that my actions will bring glory and honor to Jesus, that I will think with the mind of Christ. Paul promises us that. Think about that. Wow, Lord, give me the mind of Christ. Now maybe when you were in high school, I know I did this on several occasions, when I was in high school and I faced a test, 
I would always say, oh, Lord, may I have your mind and help me get A's on all this. And that depended upon if I was a workman who studied to show myself approved, right? If I took the time to study the material. And there were times as a high school student, well, I didn't quite do that. But God showed grace at times, allowed me to pass those tests. We discovered that we need to be spirit-filled believers continually. And we only can do that by surrendering self and submitting to the Lordship of Christ, dying daily, taking up our cross, and following Jesus, bringing Him glory and honor. And part of that is by spending time with the Lord in prayer, in our closet. Getting alone with him, we discovered that prayer matters in Colossians chapter 4 and verses 2 and following. And we looked at that and, and you know, how we can de be devoted to prayer. We need to pray that God will specifically open the doors of the gospel to be proclaimed. Because it is the transforming work of Jesus Christ that is received by those who seek him by faith, that God begins to do a supernatural, miraculous work. On one sense, we are so surprised by our world, aren't we, on how people act. I can't believe they act like that. I can't believe they reacted that way. Did you hear what they did? Did you see what they posted? Did you see what the news said? Oh, my. And in that moment, have we really taken those alarming issues that have caught us by surprise, have we taken them to our prayer closet? Have we prayed over them? Have we prayed for them? In a way that God Almighty, who loves them with an everlasting love, could minister to them and change them. Not a prayer out of selfish motives. God, forgive us of the times when we have prayed out of selfish motives. Oh, God, I wish that you would strike them down with lightning. Oh, zap. No. But, oh, God, that you would capture their attention like you did with, the, uh, with Saul on the road to Damascus and maybe blew him off his horse and caused blindness uh, to him to wake him up from his, the blindness of his heart so that he would see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the passion of Christ. And we need to exhibit that in our prayer closet. The enemy will try to do everything he can to persuade you not to pray and not to pray for others who need Jesus and not to pray for your enemy and not to pray for those who disagree with you. The enemy will do everything he can to persuade you not to pray. From the simplest of like, oh, my favorite television show is coming on. Or, gee, I'm really hungry for that cheese pizza. Or whatever it may be. Oh, they're not worthy of my prayers, Lord. May God move us with compassion to say, forgive me, Lord, of the times when I prayed in the closet selfishly and where you can move in my life that I can pray like Jesus did. This morning we are going to look further on what that means then. If we've spent time in the closet, so to speak, our prayer closet with the Lord, and we have prayed with our Heavenly Father and we listened to Him speak to us, then we are able to move out and be people who are filled with joy and be able to live the gospel. How does one live the gospel. Jesus revealed that gospel to Mary and Martha when Lazarus died. He said to them, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will not die, but live. Think about those words. Martha, Mary, do you believe this? Yes, Lord. 
This morning I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with us to Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. I believe it gives us an example in the life of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and how he demonstrated in his actions how he lived the gospel, how he lived it. And we can learn from his example this morning. We can learn from his example. So in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, follow along as we read these 10 verses. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone of, by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Father, as we now look into your holy word by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you will open up our hearts and minds to your scripture. And Father, that you not only will search our hearts, but that you will teach us about Jesus, how we as followers of Christ can live the gospel before others in a real, genuine, authentic, anointed by your spirit, being filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit way. So we ask that you will do that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mark Stiles uh, wrote this. Uh, Max Stiles uh, says this. He says, we know what it means to, true, to be a, a, a true convert. A true Christian has put his complete faith and trust in Jesus so much so that he has repented of a lifestyle of unbelief and sin. I'd like to add to his statement. I would say a true Christian has put his complete faith and trust in Jesus so much so that he has repented of a lifestyle of unbelief and sin and lives their life to serve and please God. He goes on and writes, he says, Jesus said that by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In that same discourse, he prayed that his disciples would be unified so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus said that in John 17. And Jesus says, the love we have for one another in the church is evidence that we are truly converted. The love we have for one another in the church is evidence that we are truly converted. And when we are unified in the church, we show the world that Jesus is the Son of God. Love confirms our discipleship. Unity confirms Christ's deity. What a powerful witness. Brennan Manning uh, wrote this. He says, the word, capital W, the word we study has to be the word we pray. My personal experience of the relentless tenderness of God came not from exegetes, theologians, and spiritual writers, but from sitting still in the presence of the living word and beseeching him to help me understand with my head and heart his written word. Sheer scholarship alone cannot reveal to us the gospel of grace. We must never allow the authority of books, institutions, or leaders to replace the authority of knowing Jesus Christ personally and directly. When the religious views of others interpose between us and the primary experience of Jesus as the Christ, we become unconvicted and unpersuasive travel agents handing out brochures to places we have never ever visited. Hmm. In the account here, 
of Jesus Christ meeting Zacchaeus, recorded in Luke 19, 1 through 10, we can see how Jesus lived the gospel before others. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. He came to share the news that God still loves people, all people, all people, short people, thank you, Lord, tall people, thank you, James, all right, skinny people, fat people, brown skin, black skin, yellow skin, red skin, white skin, healthy, sickly, men, women, boys, girls, the religious elites, the penitent sinner, the politician, the Roman soldier, all people, even you and me. And in our narrative this morning, Jesus reaches out to an unlikable individual. He was a person that was not well liked by his community at all. He was not respected by others. He was known as a thief and a traitor to his people. And at times he exhibited greed, dishonesty, and showed no mercy as he collected taxes for the authorities. This was Zacchaeus. And to add to his demeanor was his physical stature. He was not tall and handsome, but he was short. And what he lacked in size, he mostly likely made up in his tax dealings with others. Yet something intrigued him about Jesus. He had heard of this teacher, this rabbi from Galilee, and quite frankly, he was curious. If he could just get a glimpse of him, hmm. From afar, maybe then he would trust the words this rabbi taught. Maybe Jesus could understand the whys behind all the hate from his hometown. The crowd always got in the way. They always ridiculed and razzed him. If he did not have the tax collecting job, no one would pay attention to him at all. No one would notice him. No one would give him the time of day. He showed them by charging more on their taxes than they realized and kept that surplus for himself. The Roman government didn't care as long as they got their cut, yet deep in Zacchaeus's heart there was this aching, this gnawing, this uneasy feeling that maybe he had and was continuing to do wrong. In a religious environment like his, it was very hard to live up to the standards set by the Jewish Pharisees and Sadducees of the day. They would let you know how far one was from hitting the mark. He knew his reputation was one of the worst in town, yet it would only be a matter of time until his time ran out. Maybe Jesus, yes, maybe Jesus would be able to help. He had to see Jesus. He had to see him. But how? Everyone was taller. Everyone was bigger. <laughs> and would not show any kindness to him. For such a view or favor, their backs were turned. Then, as if lightning had struck, Zacchaeus knew what he was going to do. He was going to climb the tree. You know the tree. Yes, you know the tree. The one in town square. That one. The sycamore tree. That tree would be strong enough to hold him. The boys and girls always climbed on its branches and are supported with it by, with no trouble. That tree, he could do that. He could climb up on the sycamore tree, supported by its branches, to get a glimpse, a clear view of seeing Jesus. Even if Jesus wouldn't see him, that would be okay. As long as he could see Jesus. All that mattered at that moment was Zacchaeus looking at, watching, seeing Jesus. Maybe he felt like the woman who was sick for years and had tried everything to get well but to no avail. You remember that story? And she had come to the end of her resources, spending most of what she had on doctors and medicine, but no healing occurred. So she risked it all, thinking, if only I could touch the hem of his garment, then I would be healed. So what did that woman do? She braved the crowd. She pushed through. She shoved through. She fought her way through until she was right beside the master. All her being was filled with a nervousness, fear, and expectation of being healed. Would Jesus know if 
she touched him. What would he say? What would he do? It doesn't matter because she believed that Jesus could heal her and hoped that he would. That is what Max Lucado has defined as faith. She probably took a deep breath, then reached out and maybe closed her eyes and she reached out and she touched him. And then in that moment, Everything changed. Jesus knew who it was, and he knew that as the Bible states, power had gone out from him. He asked the question, who touched me? (laughs) Who touched me? Because he wanted her to come to him. He wanted to see her face to face. And when he did, he did not admonish her or rebuke her, nor did he let any disciples do that. He exalted her by saying that her faith had made her well. Her faith in him had made her whole. What joy filled her heart. What hope filled her soul. What love she received in that moment from Jesus. And maybe Zacchaeus heard about that. And maybe he wondered and thought about the other stories of miracles and healings and teachings this rabbi had done. And maybe Jesus would notice him. If only What would it take for Jesus to notice a short man like Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus searched within his heart, but before he knew what was happening, he heard the noise of the crowd. The crowd was active, lining up on the streets to see Jesus. The crowd of people stood watching for Jesus to come. There definitely was no room for Zacchaeus to squeeze through or push his way to the front. And the crowd may have been hoping Jesus would perform miracles, like an audience at a circus under a big tent watching and the amazing feats and flips of the flying trapeze artists. Wowed by their talents, they loved to be entertained and surprised by the teachings and miracles of the traveling rabbis. And to many of them, many of the crowd, Jesus was no different. Yet to many of them, Jesus was different. He was far superior than any traveling itinerant preacher they had ever heard before. He taught as one who had authority. He spoke differently than the religious scribes, the priests, or the Pharisees. The religious elite seemed to fulfill their duties and their weekly homilies with a dryness, a lifeless repetition. Many of them just going through the motions of being religious and close to God, but it seemed as if they were so far from the God they claimed they knew and not Jesus. There was something different about him. Yes, Jesus, when he spoke, captured people's attentions by the words he said. He really knew the God in whom he preached about. He called him father he called him father his father had sent him to seek and to save the lost and to many other ears god was holy other which meant that they could not know him or approach him without being holy they knew this and were for a time afraid of him but now they were no longer afraid they felt hopeless But then Jesus comes and preaches the good news to their ears and their hearts. It is a news that this holy God does love them deeply and God's kingdom has now arrived with the arrival of Jesus Christ. Their lives feel like a spring of living water has washed over them and restored their brokenness and given them a hope and faith. Jesus' words and even his presence reminded them that God loved them. For a moment I wonder, as you are around others, does your presence, your influence, remind them that God loves them? Although some of them were following Christ, hoping he would overthrow the Roman authorities and establish God's kingdom right in there, Some followed with a curious growing faith, like Peter, whose walk with Jesus was like a spiritual and emotional roller coaster. One moment he praised Jesus for declaring he is the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah. Then the next moment he rebukes Jesus as having Satan's interests at heart. And and then, uh, uh, you know, and then one moment he sees Christ transfigured, and then the next moment Peter wants to make it a holy place. One moment uh, Peter cuts off the high priest's servant's ear, and then later he denies even knowing Jesus. The next moment he's running to be restored 
when he sees Jesus at the shoreline on the beach than as he waits for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Peter, along with the other disciples, are filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And what does Peter do? He gets up and he proclaims the good news, the gospel to all in Jerusalem. Peter was not special in any way. What makes Peter special is how the Lord Jesus Christ met him, called him, cleansed him, forgave him, changed him, continually filled him to be a true fisher of men. Wow. Maybe that is what Jesus does best. He reaches out to the lost, the hopeless, the downtrodden, the broken, the poor, the marginalized, the misfits, the ordinary, the whomever, and calls each by name and says to them, follow me. Maybe you do not feel special in any way this morning. Hold on. In God's eyes, yes, and in Jesus Christ's eyes, you are special. What can make you special is looking to Jesus to let him meet you where you are. It takes risk, but with risk there is great reward. Jesus will meet you as you seek him, like the prophet Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Henry Blackaby said this, he said, how ordinary is your life compared with God's special assignment for you? He chooses the ordinary and the ones the world would not choose so that when he has completed his work, he alone will receive the glory. The key is not our talents, but the cultivating of our hearts. So when God does work through us, we give our praise to him and let others know it was God who accomplished the work. In this, God is greatly honored and his name glorified because everyone recognizes that he did it. Zacchaeus was about to enter an encounter with the living Christ as he had never expected or dreamed. He would, all because he was wanting and willing to see the Lord. So the crowd announced Jesus Christ's arrival. Now was a time to run to the tree. The sycamore tree was waiting with a short trunk and wide lateral branches. This would be a perfect perch to catch a glimpse of the one many considered to be the Messiah. Luke 19, 4 says, So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Do you long to see Jesus? What would it take for you to run to him? To abandon all the strange looks from the crowd as you flew by them? Their mocking you or joking would not matter. You are running to see Jesus. And Zacchaeus ran and he found the tree and he started to climb the tree. And the noise and the jeers of the crowd surrounding Jesus was growing louder. Closer they were coming. Was he in time? Could he see as he climbed? He looked for that perfect branch, that spot that would elevate him above the crowd. And there it was. And reaching out to it, I can imagine as he stretched out his arms, one of his sandals fell off, <laughs> causing onlookers below to look up and scowl at him. But then a voice was calling, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus listened intensively. It was Jesus. Yes. Quite sure it was Jesus that was yelling his name. Whose name? One of the disciples, maybe? Mm. Or one of the people in the crowd getting in the way? Mm. Whose name? What? Sounds like Zacchaeus. My name. It may have took all the physical strength of Zacchaeus had to not only hang on to that tree, but to keep himself up from bursting into emotional tears when he clearly heard Jesus say his name. And I can imagine Zacchaeus clutching on the limb, slowly opening his eyes, his vision at first blurred by the tears of elation that Jesus knew his name. His vision clearing. Jesus knew his name. He could see Jesus beneath him at the right spot by the tree. As Luke reminds us in verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. What was this that the master said? 
What was this that he is using? He, he wants me, he wants Zacchaeus, to, he wants me to come down the tree, to hurry up and get down with haste to come down. There's no time to waste for Jesus is requesting to come and stay at Zacchaeus' house today. Not only did Jesus know his name, but he saw him. Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and spoke to him. Guess what? God Almighty knows your name. And God Almighty sees you. This outcast, Zacchaeus, he was not liked by others in his community. This lost man, he was part of the tribes of Abraham. Jesus singled out. Jesus lifted up. Jesus called him and said, hurry, I want to stay at your house today. Jesus does this. It's so beautiful to see how Jesus meets us where we are. He reaches out to us in our most desperate times. He calls out to us by name, not once, but maybe over and over and over until we take notice and listen and respond. Jesus, he is the gospel, the good news of God personified. He says to those who receive him that they too will be able to live this good news, this gospel before others. The secret of reaching lost men and women with the gospel is Jesus. Christ telling others what Jesus has done in your life for you. Zacchaeus had a great testimony. Notice the transformation that took place. Luke 19 verse 6 Notice that verse, it says, so he came down and welcomed him gladly. The Greek word for gladly is chiro, which means to rejoice, to be glad, to be joyful, to be full of joy. No more did the opinion of others matter because Jesus noticed him. Jesus spoke to him. Jesus invited him to have fellowship with him. And this caused great joy to be in Zacchaeus. Yet the crowd. How did they respond? These people who knew Zacchaeus, they did not like this at all. They reacted. Verse 7 of Luke 19 states, all the people saw this. Did they rejoice? Were they happy for Zacchaeus? No, they began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. The crowd began to mutter, to be indignant, to murmur, aghast at the outcome of this encounter. They were not only disappointed, but grumbling and even maybe turning against Jesus in that moment. As one translation states it this way, he has gone to in to be the guest of and lodge with a man who is devoted to sin and preeminently a sinner. Maybe the crowd was so disappointed that there wasn't going to be a show. There wasn't going to be any miracles on display. We want to see you turn water into wine, Jesus. We want to see you heal a blind man. We want to see you feed us like you did the 5,000. <laughs> Yet the miracle was taking place right before them. Jesus was at work. He was calling a preeminently sinner to repentance through the act of unconditional love. And the crowd was missing it. They didn't see it. This was a real life lost in sin, now radically transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So much so. Notice verses 8 through 10. Notice what took place. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, to the Lord he was speaking to, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Real transformation that takes place on the inside of a person is displayed on the outside by the actions and decisions they make. Real transformation takes place on the inside of a person and it's displayed on the outside by the actions 
and decisions they make. Their behavior matches their belief. Their belief matches their behavior. And for Zacchaeus, Christ had met him and his encounter with Jesus changed everything. This change was evident by him giving half his possessions to the poor. This change was evident by him repaying back four times the amount of money from those he cheated. This was not a pious statement to impress Jesus. This was a confession that Christ was now the Lord and Savior of his heart. Not self, not money, not position, not power not revenge. Jesus responds, and he tells Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your house. Zacchaeus was a wealthy man, yet harassed, neglected, dishonest tax collector, and now he was accepted by Christ. He was loved by Christ. He was noticed by Christ. He was changed. And he was saved by Christ. What about you this morning? You may ask yourself, who do you relate to most in this account, this story? Do you relate to Zacchaeus? (laughs) You feel, you don't feel special. You feel like an outcast. Maybe somebody's hurt you, or you're filled with bitterness or resentment or anger. Oh, you've tried to do things, but only through your position and power can you make an impact, and maybe you've done that with wrong motives. Maybe you relate to the crowd. Jesus, you should have noticed me. I'm better than Zacchaeus. I'm taller. You should have noticed me. Or maybe one of the disciples who were probably just trying to fight back the crowd and not really knowing what was going on and you're just going through the motions, traveling along. Are you wanting to see Jesus? To gaze and just catch a glimpse of him? knowing that if you do, he will meet you. What do you need Jesus Christ to do for you? What do you need Jesus Christ to do for you? What do you need Jesus Christ to do for you? He accepts you as you are. But by his grace, he will not leave you as you are. So let him do his transforming work in your life and heart today. How about right now? Let's pray. Father, I realize that this morning was sort of kind of a different sermon, a retelling of an event that took place in Jesus' life. And Lord, if we just take time as people to pause and meditate on your word and think about you, how Jesus acted, how he spoke, how he responded to others, and if we can learn from his example by your spirit teaching us, guiding us, correcting us, that we will allow your Holy Spirit to change us and transform us. Almighty God, you do see every person, every soul, for you are all-knowing. And you know the needs And Lord, whatever comes to your children's heart and mind in this moment, the need, may they bring that need to you.
Yes, Father, you displayed Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, was able to turn water into wine, was able to walk on water, was able to calm a storm, was able to heal the blind, cause the lame to walk, was able to take upon himself all of our sin, past, present, and future, and die on the cross, shedding his blood, and then rising again, defeating death and hell, and promises to return. And while we are waiting for his return, you have graciously given your spirit that we may be men and women filled with the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word, for Christ, the living word. And that in these moments, we will cast all our care, our anxiety upon you, for you care for us. Thank you. Lord, I ask that you will supply by your power, for your glory, for your honor, by your spirit, whatever resources, <laughs> supernatural, that they may be to meet and answer those needs according to your will. And we will give you all the praise. May we be like a Zacchaeus filled with joy that we will no longer walk in darkness, but that we will walk in the light of love. Help us to love one another and help us to be light in this world, to share the good news, so that when we're around other people, they will know, oh God, that you love them. Thank you for what you are doing and what you are going to do. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. We're going to invite you to stand together and we're going to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Let's stand. Jane.
so thankful that while we were still sinners, you gave Christ to die for us. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for the truth that we belong to you and you are ours. And Lord, I pray that you will continue to mold and shape us and make us to be like Christ, not just on Sunday morning, but Lord, every day of the week, on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, that, oh God, the power of your Holy Spirit in our hearts will be a burning fire, a light holy flame of love that shines brighter than the brightest star, that those who are still enslaved in the kingdom of darkness will see the hope of glory in us and know, oh God, may they know your love. Your love that's pure and kind. Your love that rejoices in the truth. Your love that forgives and keeps no record of wrong. Your love. So as we go from this place, Lord, today, we go as your ambassadors. And may we reach out to the Zacchaeuses and our sphere of influence. God loves them. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.